It's all in how you look at it. Have you heard that phrase? It's all in how you look at it. There's some truth to that. And I'll give you some examples of that. Just take a look at that. What do you see? What do you see? Do you see the face of a woman? Or do you see our good friend Chuck Gonzalez playing the saxophone? Could see that, right? Yeah, it's one. Okay, try the next one. What do you see there? You see the face of a guy? Or do you see someone wearing a big parka looking in a doorway? You can see either one, right? People do. Okay, try the next one. Ah, what do you see there? Is that a, is that a chalice that's white? Or is that two people who are getting into each other's personal space? Is that what that is? Right? Could be either. How you look at it? Okay, try the next one. That's a famous one. Okay. How many people see a duck? Who sees a duck? Okay. How many people, your first thing, we see a rabbit? A few rabbits. Okay. Yeah, it's the duck or the rabbit. That's, that's the famous one, by the way. Yeah, it's the famous one. Okay, try another one. That one's cute. Okay. So you might see a woman wearing a fur, or you might see a man with a gigantic mustache. Or you might see something else. Who knows? It's all in how you look at it. Okay, try another one. That's a weird one, right? I mean, we're supersizing everything now, but that's ridiculous, right? That's a giant bottle of Coke. It's as much as I drink in two days, so that's something. Okay. All right, how about this? So some of you see uh, an, an older woman. And some of you see from a different angle a young woman, correct? This is from the picture. Here's what the original uh, caption on this said. So it says, the guy writes, my wife and my mother-in-law are both in this picture. Find them. <laughs> you know, as it turns out, the guy who did that died in a tragic accident right after that. So it's not, didn't work out, did not work out well for him. Okay, how about this one? Look at this. Take a good close look at that. It's really not moving. That's just you. That's just you. So if you've never done drugs, you know how the world looks to people who have, okay? It's like, that's a still picture, I promise. But the appearance is that it's, that it's moving. Okay, here's one of my favorites. How about this? How many legs does this elephant have? Take a look at this picture. How many legs? Take a look. Think. Thinking to yourself, well, you know, he could have four or five or six if you're wearing the, the wrong glasses or you just got up, he could have eight or ten. could go any way. But it's all in how you look at it. The images are drawn a particular way. One way, static how they're drawn, but you look at it, you see something different depending on how you look. Show this last one. This is kind of famous too. And most of you know that. So you see two different horizontal lines that are running parallel. And some of you already know the actual sort of uh, trick, optical illusion to this is that both of the horizontal lines are exactly the same length. It's just what's on the end of them that makes the difference in, in your perception. And so it's all in the way that you, that you look at it. We call some of those things optical illusions. Optical illusions. Now, this one's not. So you take this and you go... I'll try again. Now, not an optical illusion at all, but it is perception. Is the glass half full or half empty? And it really is all in the way that you look at it. Your outlook on things sometimes represented in the way you see something as half full or half empty. But that outlook about things in your life as a whole makes all the difference. 
We're in the third week of a series entitled Follow the Star. And it's a series based on the journey of the wise men from the biblical nativity story. And, and we're thinking about how in this new year you and I can see things in different ways and we can do things differently than we've done before. And it's based, like the wise men, on a journey where, where you find Jesus. And maybe that's a long journey for some of you. Maybe you're still a long way away from that point. Maybe you're still on that point. Others of you, you've, you've already found him. You've come there and you've had this encounter with Jesus. And you realize now that things can be different and things are different because of that. Follow the star. You've found the light that is Jesus. And you can see things differently on your journey. You can see positive things in a different light. You can see negative things in a different light. You can see everything in a different light. And that makes all the difference in your life, in how you see things and in how you do things. So if you've got your Bible, it's the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers. We're going to look at a story there real quick this morning. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So it's in the fourth book in the Bible there from the beginning. Uh, you can look. There's a Bible underneath the seat in front of you if you don't have a Bible with you. We'll put the verses we talk about on the screen. But if you really want to get a glimpse of the whole story, kind of chapters 12 through 14 would, would cover most of that. So this is a story, the, the Old Testament people of Israel. This is a story uh, picking up where they've been delivered from 400 years of bondage. So they've been enslaved for four centuries in the land of Egypt. And God has freed them. He's brought them out of that place. He's brought them on a journey, leading them to a new land that's going to become their homeland. And in the Bible, that land is generally referred to as the land of Canaan. So we pick this up. Uh, Numbers chapter 12, verse 16, starts like this. After the people left Hazareth city there, uh, they camped in the wilderness of Paran. Now, the wilderness of Paran is right on the edge of what is called the land of Canaan, right next door. So here they are, right on the edge of where God wanted them to go and where he wanted them to be, right on the edge of the land that God was giving them. And they got there and they camped there. Now, here's an interesting thing. In many ways, perhaps you and I are they. In many ways, you and I are are they? A lot of us are right on the edge of where God wants us to be. Some of you are on a long journey, have come a long journey to get there. Some of you are still in the middle of that and you say, hey, I'm not, I'm not quite to the edge yet, but I'm on that journey. I'm like the wise man. I'm following that star. I'm looking. I'm, I'm on my way to get there. Others of you have gotten really, really close, right on the edge, doing what God wants you to do, of, of taking the next step that God wants you to take. And you're right next door, so it's really only one step away, but you've camped there instead. I have this conversation with our staff in a, in a lot of different contexts about our church. And here we start another year, 2020, and all the things that are coming with it. And I think this, and we talk about this with our church in so many ways, that way that we're kind of right on the edge of where God wants us to be, right on the edge of this sort of outbreak of making this, this bigger difference that we really believe God wants us to make in people's lives and, and helping people in their relationship of finding and, and following Jesus, becoming the disciples that, that God wants us all to be, that we're kind of right on the edge of that one step away, right on the edge of making the impact in our community, with our friends and our, and our family who don't yet know Jesus, right on the edge of that, right on the edge of making a bigger difference in our world, one step away from that, but a lot of times we stay camped right where we are, and there's a lot of, a lot of reasons for that. We, we're right next door, so we could take the step, but we haven't, so we end up camped right next door year after year after year. It's not that we can't take the step, but, but many times it's our outlook on what's next that holds us back. The people of Israel, they're right on the edge of where God was taking them, right on the edge of where he wanted them to be. All, all they have to do is take the next step, but they didn't see it that way. In fact, they saw something completely different. Here's the story. Numbers chapter 13. I'm going to read a couple of different sections, three sections of of verses there. Beginning with verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, the leader of Israel, he said to him, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. Uh, from each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So, at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the wilderness of Paran. All of them were leaders of Israel. So they went out and they explored the land, and then they came back and they gave their report. Verse 27 in uh, Numbers 13, they gave this account to Moses. 
we went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Now, you maybe have heard that phrase, the land flowing with milk and honey, and you say, what in the world does that mean? Well, according to the, uh, the rabbinical tradition of Judaism and the Talmud, which is kind of their commentary on the law, they, they use that phrase. It, it's, a, it's an idiomatic phrase, but it refers to uh, the milk of goats. So that's like going into land and going, they have plenty of goats there to provide fresh milk. And, uh, and of course, if you've ever had goat's milk, you wouldn't want that. You'd say, can we bring in the cows and forget the goats? But uh, it's goats for the milk. And uh, actually, honey was probably a metaphor for the figs, that the figs were growing in that land. Now, that makes perfect sense when you see the next part of that verse. He says, here is the fruit. Here's the fruit. So they brought back some figs, probably. Maybe they stole a couple of goats. I don't know. So they brought something back. But the people who live there, they go on, are powerful people. And, and the cities are fortified, and they're very large. And we saw the descendants of Anak there. The men who had gone up said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. These descendants of Anak, uh, they're there. And we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look the same to them. So here's the outlook, and we're going to call this the majority view. It says there's no way we can take that next step into this land. We better stay camped right where we are because there's no way we can take this next step into the land. Twelve guys, one from each of the tribes, the twelve tribes of Israel, they're sent out. And contrary to the story, if you grew up in Sunday school and you heard, we heard them referred to as spies or scouts, and they did spy out the land and they did go scout, but the Bible is very clear who they are. They are leaders of each tribe. So these are not just, these are not just uh, lower level uh, folks. These are leaders sent out to see the land that God is giving to the Israelites for a homeland. And so they come back and 10 of the 12 gave to Moses what we will call the majority report. And here's what was in the majority report. They saw big problems there. The land was great. There was a lot to be gained. It was a beautiful land. But there were also real obstacles, big obstacles. The cities were big, the cities were fortified, and then this great land, there were giants in the land. Now, when they say giants, they're probably really referring to some, some giant soldiers and warriors that they saw, probably uh, descendants of the original inhabitants of Canaan, one of the, one of the uh, Cushite tribes from, from Babel. Uh, th these were large, imposing warriors. So you could imagine an entire army made up of guys, you know, the size of Shaquille O'Neal or somebody like that. And they said, man, these soldiers are too big. These giants are too big. There's no way we can conquer this. You need to just book us on the next flight back to Egypt. Because there's no way that we can take this land. Now, before you are really hard on them, understand, they're just telling you the straight story. The land is really nice, but the giants are really big, and we're just telling you the truth. There's big problems. We can't do that. And a lot of people would agree with that. Hey, there are giants in the land. If we clash with them, we're, we're, we're going to get wiped out, and that's just how we see it. Maybe it's this way of looking at the glass is half empty. And if we try to go in this land, we'll be completely dead trying to take on these giants. So the majority outlook said that the problems here are too big. We can't overcome. And then here's the second thing, and it sort of implied the majority had a small, a small view of God. A small view of God. They, they were right. They compared themselves against the giants, and they concluded uh, we felt like grasshoppers next to them, and that's what we looked like to them. So we felt like grasshoppers. They saw us as grasshoppers. There's no way that we can do this. These men are stronger. These cities are fortified. There's no way. By comparison, we're too small. They're too large. But then think about this. Implied in the middle of that, where, where is their vision of the God who said, I'm giving this land to you? Where's their vision of the God that led them out of, out of Egypt? Where's their vision of the God with, with this power who could give this land to them? They don't seem to see that. Is their God not big enough to give them this land? That's how they saw it. I love the story. There's a fifth grade Sunday school class and they go home and they're given this assignment. Go out in your backyard uh, on, at nighttime and take a look at the stars and I want you to count the stars and come back next week and tell me how many stars you count. So the kids all come back the next week and they've done that, gone out in the backyard, looked at the stars and said, okay, how many stars did you count? You know, one kid says, well, I counted a hundred stars. Another kid says, well, I counted a thousand. And then you know how it multiplies. Another kid said, no, 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 I counted a I counted hundred thousand. I counted a million stars. I counted 1.5 billion stars. They finally get down to one kid and said, how many stars did you count? He said, three. He said, three? How in the world could you only count three? He said, I don't know. I guess we just have a small backyard. <laughs> well, they had a small vision of God. They didn't see the power of God. It's kind of like an optical illusion. They saw the giants but did not see the power of God and the difference that it would make. 
we can be the same way. You can have a small vision of God where you really don't see the power that God has. And so you come face to face with giants that you have to battle. And you say, no, no, they're too big and I'm too small. The obstacles are too big and I'm too weak. I won't be able to go forward. So you do, you go backward. Look at verse uh, chapter 14, the beginning of that. They're ready to go backward. And all the members of the community wept aloud and they grumbled against Moses and Aaron, the leaders of Israel. And the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or if only we had died in this wilderness, at worst we'll go backwards, at best we'll just stay put. Camped right outside where God wants us to be. Do you want to let another year elapse like that? Where at best, I mean at worst you go backwards... Or at best, you just stay put where you are. Leaders of Israel, representing the majority of the people, they saw the land where God wanted to be. They said, there's giants there. Uh, We're too small. We're like grasshoppers. They could stomp us. Nowhere in their vision did they see the God who miraculously led them out of Egypt, I guess. Nowhere did they see the God who parted the Red Sea. Nowhere did they see the God who delivered them from Pharaoh's army coming after them. Nowhere did they see the God who fed them in the wilderness when they had no food, provided water for them, brought them to the edge of this new home. Their God was too small. And unless you see a bigger God, unless you believe in a God who's going to do bigger things in your life and a God who would do bigger things in our church, we'll never make it to where God wants us to be. We'll never be the people that God has called us to be. Because like the majority view in Israel there, we'll simply say, no way. No way. And we have reasons. But there was a minority view. They would see it God's way. There were two guys, Joshua and Caleb. So 12 total, two of them, Joshua and Caleb. By the way, who knows the name of one of the other 10? Right? Nobody. Nobody knows them. Forgotten about them. Two guys in the minority report who went on to become famous, they saw it different. Twelve went out together, uh, all leaders. They, they, went, they came back in two separate groups, but they traveled together. They went the same route. They had access to seeing all the same things. Yet they come, came back with two different outlooks. Verse 30, Caleb tried to encourage him as he stood before Moses. He said, let's go take the land. We can conquer it. Within this group of 12, 10 of them saw only the obstacles, but two of them saw not only the obstacles, but they saw the opportunities in there. Maybe we'd say it this way, they they saw something that others missed. Or we'd say, you know, they they could all agree on at least a limited set of facts there. They saw that the land was good and there were giants in the land and cities were big. And they all agreed on those things. But they interpreted those facts and their experiences and their understanding of God and their view of God were completely different. Completely different. It's like a kid, I know he brought home his report card and he had really bad grades and he was scared to give it to his dad and he gave it to his dad and his dad looked at the grades and, you know, confronted him and said, what do you have to say about all these bad grades on your report card? And the little boy said to his dad, you should be proud of me. You should be proud of me. And the dad like blew up as you could imagine. He said, proud, how can I be proud of this? These are C's and D's and some F's. How could I possibly be proud of this? And the little boy said, because you know absolutely for sure I have not been cheating. Not been cheating. Well, it's all in how you look at it, right? Those are the facts. But how do you interpret that data? Joshua and Caleb didn't simply see the facts, the report card. The land is good. There are giants in the land. They saw something the others missed. They saw God at work. And sometimes only a minority of people see God at work. You need to be, I need to be in that minority. Anais Nin, the great French essayist, said this. We don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. We see them as we are. So your outlook has to do with, with who you are. People can look at all the same stuff and the same set of facts and the same set of situation. Yet Joshua and, Joshua and Caleb saw something different because they had a, a different outlook within them. And a different view of God that others didn't see. So they said, we can take this land, we can conquer it because God has given it to us. Real quick, we're going to go through these. Here's the way, here's the challenge for us. Can you see it the way they saw it and, and what they saw there? Very, very quickly. Number one, see God's way, carry out his plan. It was God's plan for them to go forward and take this land. It wasn't kind of like the story of Christopher Columbus where he accidentally got to the land. He was going someplace else and got here. This was God's plan to give them that land. 
So do you believe that God has a plan for you for what it is in your life moving forward? Is there something that God has planned for you? It's not just something you want to do or something you could accidentally stumble into, but something that God created you for, called you to do. Trust Him and carry out that plan. Here's number two. Uh, See the way call on God's power. Chapter 14, verse 9. Don't rebel against the Lord. Uh, Do not be afraid of the people because we will devour them. That's that's an idiomatic phrase that basically said that they're, literally it says because they are our food. Meaning we will will eat them up kind of thing. Like in the same way of just eating a piece of bread, we'll we'll win this. Because God's power was at work then. Not by might, not by power, but by God's spirit. God's power at work in our lives. So when you look at obstacles, something bigger than you, and you say, as they rightly did, we're like grasshoppers, they're giants, there's no way we can overcome them. No way except one. The power of God active and working in their lives. I, I share this with you a lot. My favorite verse in the Bible, if I had to pick just one, is Ephesians 3.20. Ephesians 3.20. This great sort of doxology in the middle of this, of this great letter. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more. It's my favorite translation. Immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that's at work within us. To him be the glory. Number three. See God's way and claim his promise. Claim his promise. Verse 2, chapter 13. This is the land of Canaan that I'm giving you. To you. God's promise to them. Not the, not the obstacles, not, not all the problems, but God's promise of what he was going to do. If we believe in a big God and we believe that, that, that he's going to do what he says and we're willing to take that next step, then we can take hold of God's promises in our lives. I'm giving you this land. But they didn't believe that. And instead, because they didn't believe that, they wandered around the wilderness for 40 years until all those who didn't believe that died off. Guess what? The same promise and the same situation confronts us. We obviously can wander around for the next 40 years if we want to. Or we can take God up on his promise. Last one. I count on his presence. Count on his presence. The end of verse 9 there. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid. All they had with the, was the Lord. The giants were bigger. The giants were stronger. The cities were fortified. They, didn't have, they, they were wrong, off on all those things. All they really had was God was with them. But God was enough. God was enough. I love this, this picture. It's my favorite. <laughs> I don't even know why, right? Because right? you'd be doing the same thing. If you came face to face with the rhino, you'd be running just like that. Only I'd probably be losing and he would be trampling me by this point. But the truth is, with God, when there are things that you are afraid of, whether it's a rhino or a giant, with God, you don't have to run. You certainly don't have to run from God. God is the one who runs, and He never runs away from you. He runs towards you. Because He's going to be with you, whatever you face. And some of us are going to face giants this year. All kinds of different things. Who knows what they'll be. Some of us will face health giants this year, and you'll go, I don't know how to conquer that. But God will be with you, and He's got a plan. Some of you have faced, you know, situations in relationships in your family where there are situations and you go, oh, it's just too many things. I don't know how to work it out. God's presence will be with you. Some of you are going to face being mistreated in, in ways this year. And, and, and the challenge for you is not to respond back in, in a way of anger or a way of bitterness, but, but for God to give you the power to respond back in the right way, whatever it is. God will empower you to do that because he's with you. But for that to happen, you've got you've to believe that. You've got to believe that God's not only in this room with us on a Sunday morning, but that God's in your heart and that He's in your life. And He's in every situation that you face. And when you believe that, you can have a new outlook and you can see God take down some giants that maybe were haunting you in years past. That were stalking you in years past. That were stomping on you in years past. But you've got to believe that. We'll close with this. And it's really true. The story doesn't end well. This story in Numbers 13 and 14 doesn't end well. Ten out of the twelve leaders, they, they say we're not going forward in the promised land. That they, the, the giants are too big and we can't do it. They convince everybody else with that wrong outlook. And rather than going into the land, they say let's get new leaders and let's go back to Egypt. And that's exactly what they plan to do. Numbers 14 uh, verse 3 and th- 4. Why did God bring us out here? Why did he bring us out here just to die by the sword? Our our wives and our children will become the, the plunder for the enemy. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, quote, we should choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Now, that's probably good, right? If they go back to Egypt, they were upstanding citizens there, correct? They were middle class people there. They were headed to be the one percenters there, correct? 
No, that's not correct. They were slaves back in Egypt. What are they thinking? Now they're going back the wrong way. So instead of going into the land God promised, the land God wanted them to be, God sent them back out into the wilderness. Verse 22, verse 33, back out into the wilderness. He said, what? what? They don't believe me. They've tested me this way. And then he says this great line in verse 33, your, your children are now going to wander as shepherds out in the wilderness 40 years. In this way, they'll pay for your faithlessness until the last of you lies dead in the wilderness. Do not miss this point. God took this very personally. God took their outlook personally because God is personal and your relationship with him is personal and, and, and it's not simply, you know, you believe this or you don't believe that and, you know, six one half a dozen other. You do this and you, you don't do that and it's not really that big a deal one way or another. He took very personally the fact that they personally would not, did not trust in him. Verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs I've performed among them? So God says, okay, if, if you want a different journey than the one I'm offering, you, you can have it your way. You can wander out in the wilderness. You can wander out there not following the star. You can wander out there not walking in the light, not going anywhere in particular. Mostly, historically, we now know going in circles. 20 to 40 mile radius where they wandered for 40 years. Just round and round. It's like Lawrence J. Peter said, if you don't know where you're going, you'll probably end up somewhere else. And they certainly did. You know, if that's your outlook on, on life and, and all that happens, God just might take it personally as well. Because he wants you to see things his way. Jesus Christ, in fact, died so that you could see things his way. So that you could walk in the light of a new outlook this year and every year. And the good news, of course, is that God forgave the people for their wrong outlook. He forgave them for not believing, not trusting, not, not following Him. Though, God did say to all those who said, no way, all those who said, no way, didn't trust in God, they all died in the wilderness over the next 40 years. So if we've had the wrong outlook, God will forgive us too, and He'll give us a new outlook. But don't wait another year, or another month, or another week, or another day. Because that waiting could add up to 40 years for you, for me, as well. A new outlook starts today. Because you can look at it any way you want. You can look at the glass as half full or half empty. Doesn't matter. But before you know it, it will be gone. This journey goes fast. Make sure that you are walking this journey, your journey this year, in the light of a new outlook, focused on the light that is Jesus Christ, His presence, His power, His promise, His plan in your life for a new year. Would you stand with me this morning?